All right, welcome everybody for week two on our series, critic, looking critically at Christ. Um, I'm going to open us up in prayer, and then we're going to go ahead and get started. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. We thank you, Lord, for all your blessings, and we thank you for this day, this opportunity to gather, and pray, Lord, that you would be with us in our discussion, challenge us to learn more about our faith, and um, to approach it from a different angle, because we live in a world that is very um, sadly hostile towards our faith and towards our belief, and and we need to equip ourselves with the tools and um, to have good discussions with people, um, that it would uh, serve as a testimony to our faith. Uh, through the intercessions of all your saints who have pleased you from the beginning, here says we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Christ Jesus, our Lord, for thine is kingdom, the power and glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, guys, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen for us to get going. All right. So last, you guys see the, the slides? Okay, great. So last week, we, um, we started off our series, and we... You know, the whole idea behind this series is that we live in a very skeptical world, um, and there's a lot of skepticism about uh, Christianity, and there is a lot of hostility, a lot of arguments uh, that go against our faith. Um, More about the calling. We'll take care of it tomorrow. And so while, um, while sometimes the arguments are very challenging, um, and sometimes we can feel like, you know, it's, it's out of our comfort zone to, to respond to some of the questions. Part of our job as Christians is to understand, well, what are the arguments and what are the, you know, the challenges to our faith and challenge ourselves to learn the arguments because this is the reality of the world that we live in. And one of the things that always comes under scrutiny um, is how can I trust the Bible? Or in, and specifically last week, we looked at how can we trust the um, old, the New Testament and specifically looking at the Gospels. And so this is just a summary from last week. We looked at three things with respect to the Gospel. We looked at, you know, early attestation, which is how long after the life of Christ did the, were the Gospels written? And how does that really stack up to other historical, you know, literature? And what we, we saw is that the Bible um, and, the, and the Gospels were written soon after Christ um, lived and died and, and rose and ascended and, and all these different things. And, and his bi biographies captured in the four Gospels was covered and it was covered soon after his death. Like we're talking, even St. Paul started to write about him in 1 Corinthians recounting um, the, the Last Supper. And that was probably in 50, 60 AD. And then you have the Gospel of Mark and then the Gospel of Matthew and Luke and, and John all done by 90, 95 AD. Um, and because of how strong oral tradition was, there was very, very little chance that things could have been manipulated. Um, we also talked briefly about how do we reconcile the differences that in some of the texts between the Gospels. And and one of the things that we really focus on is that when you look at the differences, it highlights that, you know, each gospel writer was writing from their own perspective and their kind of own human element was put into the writing. But when you look at the core of the story, it's all there, all right? It's all there. Nothing major is, is deviated. And so we actually see that that brings strength to the, the accounts in the Gospels. And then lastly, we looked at the New Testament manuscripts, and we said that there were 24,000 New Testament manuscripts, which are all kind of supporting and working together to show that, yeah, we have a really accurate picture of what the New Testament is. Um, so that's what we looked at last week. But the question that I'm going to pose to everybody before we get into this week is that if we were to take away, right, I think I put my question here, 
if we did not have the gospel accounts, the New Testament writings, or other Christian writings, you know, or the patristic writings, what do you think we would be able to conclude about Jesus from other historical writings, right? So if we took away everything that we kind of hold dear, so if we, if we try and like level the playing field, so to speak, and say, all right, well, what can we glean from other historical documents um, that are non-Christian? What can we glean about who Jesus was? So this is kind of open doors. So what do you think we can learn from other historical documents? Uh, would they be documents that came before the Bible then? Because they would be influenced by the Bible. Why, why do you assume that they would be influenced by the Bible? And when did the Bible come about? Which is another really interesting discussion. <laughs> well, I think there were a lot of Gospels out there that were just you know, letters and, and scriptures, and I, I forget when exactly they got put together. Mm -hmm. um, you can tell us that. I forgot the dates. No worries. No worries. We will get to some of them. But if we took away the, you know, anything that was like Christian related, what do you, what are some basic facts you think we can put together about who Jesus Christ was as a historical figure? Maybe just like some basic facts about him, like the kind of person that he was, like some of the things that we would see in like a normal historical, like in a textbook, okay. maybe like, you know, when he was born, when he died, his occupation, like those kind of basic facts. Okay. So you think we might be able to put some base, like a basic biography. Okay. Yeah, right. Right. Okay. Yeah. His, his profile probably to the Jews and Romans is he is, you know, lower middle class at a certain time was working in a craft you know carpentry or whatever family business okay or some kind of stone cutting and he was uh also known as a rabbi or a, some some kind of a teacher some kind of disciplined teacher who understood and had probably memorized scriptures okay so there's like a little bit of intrigue like a little bit of mystery behind this lower middle class person who you know is apparently like very well versed in scripture and stuff like that so there's you know there's probably a little bit of mystery to him there um we don't know if he was married or not probably wasn't married and um which was most likely strange for that time most <clears throat> most young men got married um and then, of course, like the more, you know, the more he evolved in his ministry, the more defined he got, probably as some kind of cult leader or some kind of, you know, uh, anti-Jewish uh, imposter or whatever. Mm. It's uh, interesting so that you, the, you use the word cult. Yeah, like through the Jewish and Roman lens, that would probably, you know, give some of them as some kind of like a profile. Yeah, because, for, I mean, at that, I mean... Christianity was being developed as Christ lived. And then even after his death, like the, from the Roman perspective, like they just thought Christianity was this offshoot of Judaism and like an in like an interior kind of division. And they didn't know what to make of it. Um, and a lot of times they just got, uh, you know, Christians got lumped in with Jews. Um, so, yeah, good. Any other like last thought? about what we might be able to glean historically. And the question, like as we kind of move forward that I want everybody to think about is that why would the historical accounts be significant for us, okay? Why would the historical accounts of who Jesus is 
be significant for us, okay? All right, like we did last week, we're gonna watch a video. And again, these videos come from the Case, uh, Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. I had read the book, I thought it was a great book and kind of inspired me to take on the series. And let me know if you can't hear uh, the volume or if it's not coming through. I've covered some fascinating trials over the years and watched as prosecutors have used various kinds of evidence to convict defendants. One case that stands out of my mind involves a Chicago mobster by the name of Harry. Oh, sorry. Harry Alleman. Harry was a notorious crime syndicate hitman. He was on trial for murdering a Teamsters Union shop steward. I'd written a lot of stories about Harry over the years because he was a suspect in at least a dozen different murders. I remember one time Harry Alleman cornered me and he pointed a finger really menacingly in my face and he said, why do you keep writing these stories about me? And I'll tell you what, coming from a guy of his reputation, it was a little bit intimidating. But the prosecutors had their own challenges with the case against Harry Alleman. The good news was that the getaway driver agreed to testify against Harry. The bad news was he demanded leniency in return. And the prosecutors knew that when the jurors found that out, it would call into question his motivation for testifying. They needed corroborating evidence. They needed someone else to back up what the accomplice was saying. And sure enough, they found a neighbor of the murder victim who testified that he was out walking his dog when he saw Harry Alleman commit the crime. They put him in a witness protection program. He testified against Harry Alleman, so did the accomplice. Harry was convicted, and today he's spending the rest of his life behind bars. That is the power of corroborating evidence in a court of law. The question is, do we have any corroboration for the New Testament of the Bible? Do we have any evidence outside the Bible that corroborates what the New Testament tells us about Jesus? Following the pattern of my investigation, my next step was to determine whether or not there was any evidence outside the New Testament that corroborates what the New Testament tells us. Jesus, of course, wasn't the emperor of the Roman Empire. He wasn't some autocrat that had conquered half of the world, but he did leave an impact in his own environment and created a movement that grew from there. And there is a remarkable amount of documents and corroboration. Josephus refers to him. The Roman historian Tacitus uh, refers to him, Suetonius, the political writer, refers to him, uh, critics refer to him, and so uh, it's like a stone thrown into a pond. The ripples go out and out and everywhere are felt. It's a very impressive record taken as a whole. In AD 93, the Jewish historian Josephus published his work Antiquities of the Jews. Scholars generally agree that the following text accurately records Josephus' record of Jesus. Now there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, for he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure. He drew over to him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. When Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men amongst us, had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him first did not forsake him. And the tribe of Christians, so named for him, are not extinct to this day. In a court of law, the rebuttal case is an opportunity opportunity for the other side to present their evidence. When well, recent years there's been a proliferation of books and articles about the so-called Gnostic Gospels, and I wanted to figure out, does this represent the mainstream of academic scholarship? 
The Gnostic Gospels are a collection of religious writings from the second and third centuries. They blend the teachings of Jesus with a variety of ancient philosophical beliefs. According to the tenets of Gnosticism, the universe was the creation of a flawed and wicked God. Therefore, all matter was evil. Salvation from this world could only be attained through secret knowledge about the spiritual nature of man. There's been a lot of talk about the Gnostic Gospels, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, the Gospel of Philip, the Gospel of Thomas. These documents are almost universally recognized to be much later than the New Testament Gospels and not to record uh, historically reliable material related to Jesus. Well, the New Testament Gospels give us a portrait of a early first century Palestinian Jesus of Nazareth. The Gospels from the second century which are mostly Gnostic Gospels, such as the Gospel of Judas, or the Gospel of Thomas, or the Gospel of Philip, or the Gospel of Mary, they give us a very different Jesus. Now you can pick and choose if you want. You can say, well, I like the second century Gnostic Jesus better. Others might want the early first century Palestinian Jesus. But if you're gonna be a scholar about it, and you're gonna talk about, well, which Gospels really do give us earlier traditions that more reliably reflect the actual historical Jesus, you got to go with the New Testament Gospels every time. There's a view among some that there were all of these different competing views of Jesus Christ and that the one that won out became the orthodox perspective of Christ um, reflected in the Gospels. Um, all the evidence runs contrary to that. Jesus was a first century Jewish teacher um, who revealed and demonstrated himself to be the Messiah. Uh, that's the presentation we get in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the New Testament Gospels. Uh, these later Gospels, these Gnostic Gospels, um, present a very different Jesus, almost a Greek philosopher, an esoteric Gnostic Jesus. It's clearly not the authentic historical Jesus. What I've come to discover is that the Gospels in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are our best sources for Jesus. And I've also found that they are reliable and that from these sources, we can form a picture that I believe is very accurate, that tells us about Jesus, what he taught, how he was perceived by his contemporaries and what his life was really all about. Everything from Jesus' parables, to his healings, to his controversies, to his warnings, and all of that, the reason they were telling this stuff is that not just it was good advice for them in their own day, but that it actually mattered, that it actually happened. And if it hadn't happened, you're into a totally different worldview, a worldview which is about ideas, which is about self-realization, hugely popular in our culture just now, discovering who I really am. You know, for goodness sake, Jesus didn't come to help me discover who I really am. He came to tell me who he knew I really was and to do something about it. And that's much better news. Any quick thoughts about or reflections on that video? All right, so in the next part, all right, what I'm gonna do is show you quotes from different um, early century um, historians or, or their documents are now considered historical documents that are non-Christian, um, that are, um, you know, I'll give you the biography of each. And what I want us to do is to, you know, I want everybody to kind of shout out like quick bullet points of like, what do you think when we read this, it tells me about who Jesus was historically, right? And, and the challenge for everybody today is to kind of take off your like, well, I see everything from the lens of, of a Christian, okay, which it's impossible for us to kind of, if you will, take that bias out. But we need to challenge ourselves to take that out of the picture and say, okay, well, when we read other historical you know, documents, what does that tell us about who Jesus is? 
And then again, we're gonna come back to the, the, that question at the end is like, why is that so significant? Okay, why do like the other accounts, other historical accounts um, matter to us? And then we are gonna address the Gnostic gospels, right? Because that also has to come into the picture, right? So the first one is coming from Josephus and a little background on Josephus and got some in the video, but he was born in 37 AD, died in 93 AD. Uh, he wrote four uh, key works. One of them was the Antiquities, which is supposed to be the history of the Jewish people from creation all the way till the time he passed. He was, he was a priest and a Pharisee, so he was a Jew um, himself, but he definitely, you know, was, he didn't believe in, in who Jesus was, all right? Uh, so he wasn't a Christian. So when we read one of his quotes, okay, I'll read it, and then ask you guys a question. What do we learn from this? For, what, about, what do we learn historically about Jesus? Now, there was about this time Jesus a wise man, for he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure. He drew over to him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. When Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men among us, had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him first did not forsake him. And the tribe of Christians so named for him are not extinct to this day. So it's the same one that was in the video. So historically, what do we learn from, what do we learn about Christ? He was a wise man and okay. he had the capability to draw the, the Jews and the Gentiles. Good. So teacher wise drew Jews and Gentiles. He was crucified. Okay. He was, he was crucified. He must have, I guess, spoke with much conviction as to as to his followers to continue following him and believing like in him after the fact. Uh, so there's something unique about the way he taught yes. because when he was crucified and the Romans, we know the Romans were nasty, like those that loved him, as it says here, did not forsake him. So there's something unique about his message. I like this part where it says um, he did wonderful works, okay? Because what does that tell us? Like there was something unique about what he did. Like his miracles left an imprint on those that loved him and they were known by other people, okay? So wonderful works, teacher, um, converted Jews and Gentiles, crucified under Pilate, um, those that loved him didn't forsake him, and they're existing to this day, all right? Another one from Josephus. He convened a meeting of the Sanhedrin and brought before them a man named James, the brother of Jesus, who was called the Christ, and certain others. He accused them of having transgressed the law and delivered them up to be stoned. Uh, it says that um, Jesus had brothers. Okay, so we get a little bit, as we were saying before, like the, the like the profiling of who he was. So he had a brother named James. Okay. And that he is perceived to have transgressed the law. Yeah, so I think they're referring to like James and the other people who are with him who are related to Christ. Right, so it's talking about his followers. Yeah, that they that they transgress alone. Great. What else? One more key thing that I want us to pick up from this. 
That they called him Christ? Exactly. Why is that so significant? Because the Jews have been awaiting the Christ for a long time. Good, good. So it's relating him to what, like, the, in the Jewish tradition, that, like, the Christ will come. Right? Anybody who's, like, called the Christ, like, you're fulfilling the Old Testament prophecy. So, good, that's really significant. And this is coming, you know, from a non-Christian historian. Great, great, great. All right, let's... Um, uh, put that in twice all right i'll give you another historian so this guy tacitus is a roman historian he wrote the annals and these were written about 115 a.d all right so nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations called christians by the populace christus from whom the name had its origins suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our pure creators, Pontius Pilate. And a most mischievous superstition thus checked for the moment again broke out not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but even in Rome. All right, so just as a little background, so Nero was an emperor and he was known as such a narcissistic uh, emperor. Narcissistic in the sense that he, you know, there was a, a major fire in 64 AD of Rome, and it was suspected that Nero set fire to Rome because he wanted to build a new empire somewhere else, but he couldn't justify it. So he set fire to Rome. And, and what he did was he blamed the Christians for setting fire. All right, so that's a little background to what he's talking about. So when he says Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures. So what do we learn? Any takers? That Christ suffered the extreme penalty, which presumably means he was killed? Well, he's talking about the Christians. So Nero blamed the Christians, okay? And they were, they were tortured because they were blamed for setting fire, right? So they're falsely accused. But in that same vein, okay, that these were now by we're talking about like 65 AD so we're about 35 years removed from Christ and we're we're in Rome now right so we get this sense that you know Christos who is who is referred to that name is refer, referring to Christ okay had believers called Christians that made it all the way to Rome and they were a big enough uh, group of people so that Nero used them as an escape goal. So it tells us about like how, how fast of a growing body of believers this is for them to just start in Judea and then grow to Rome to such a, an extent that Nero used them as an escape goal for the fire tells us something about how big this movement of Christianity was. And then just as another point, we, we get this confirmation that Christ was the one who was crucified under Pontius Pilate, right? So we get another verification of some of the facts that we know about who Jesus was and his life. All right, I think this, this is the last one, all right? Pliny the Younger. Um, so he lived from 61 uh, to about 113 A.D., he was the governor of Bithynia, which is in northwest Turkey, 
right? And he was a friend of Emperor Trajan. And they were said to exchange letters back and forth. And these letters are, um, many of them were actually kept over 240 or something of these letters were, were kept. And so um, they tell us a lot about like life and what was happening and, and what was happening on the, you know, the upper level discussion between, um, you know, high-ranking officers of the Roman Empire. And so he says, I have asked them if they are Christians. And if they admit it, I repeat the question a second and third time with a warning of the punishment awaiting them. If they persist, I order them to be led away for execution. For whatever the nature of their admin, admission, I am convinced that their stubbornness and unshakable obstinacy ought not to go unpunished. They also declared that the sum total of their guilt or error amounted to no more than this. They had met regularly before dawn on a fixed day to chant verses alternate, alternate, alternately amongst themselves in honor of Christ as if to a God, and also to bind themselves by oath, not for any criminal purpose, but to abstain from theft, robbery, and adultery. This made me decide it was all the more necessary to extract the truth by torture from two slave women, whom they called deaconesses. I found nothing but a degenerate sort of cult carried to the extravagant lengths. What are a couple quick things that you get from this? There's a ton in here. Uh, I think it shows the perseverance of Christians that, Good. you know, even though they're told uh, the, that they will be punished three times, um, they persist and uh, are executed, many of them, and that they're stubborn and that he could not find anything really criminal in their behavior. I know, isn't it kind of ridiculous? So, like you want to like torture people who abstain from theft, robbery, and adultery. Isn't that what you want your empire to be full of? Like people who don't do that stuff? Um, you're right. Uh, the other, like, just to add to what you said, Mary, um, how they say they honor Christ as if to a God, right? That we get this idea that there are services that are happening in response to who Jesus was and the movement that he created in, in the Roman Empire. So, we get a lot of information from all these extra biblical sources that no one would really consider as Christian resources. These are two high-ranking Roman officials who are just talking about how they torture, you know, Christians. Um, so when we kind of like put it all together, we want to ask ourselves like, well, what sort of historical picture can we put um, to Jesus? All right. So kind of help me out with some of the things that were said. Right, because a lot of great things were said. I think the most important thing is that, that they were, you know, Christ and Christians are a tortured people, and yet they have survived um, yeah. incredibly in, in huge numbers. Yeah, so there were huge numbers. They were tortured for their beliefs. Okay. What are the, what other things are verified for us? They worship Christ as God. They worship Christ as God. Okay. Uh, they had chanting and verses back and forth, and they had deacons and deaconesses. Deacons, deaconesses. So there's an order uh, to their their worship. Throw out like Pontius Pilate, 
right? So he, he was verified multiple times. The crucifixion of Christ was multi, was verified. Um, so, you know, Jews and Gentiles came to him. His teachings, like, really reverberated. So there's a lot that we glean, right? And there's a historian, Edwin Yamauchi, from University of Miami of Ohio. He has this quote. He says, we would still have a considerable amount of important historical evidence about Jesus without the New Testament. In fact, it would provide a kind of outline for the life of Jesus. We would know that first, Jesus was a Jewish teacher. Second, many people believed that he performed healings and exorcisms. Third, some people believed he was the Messiah. Fourth, he was rejected by the Jewish leaders. Fifth, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate in the reign of Tiberius. Six, despite the shameful death, his followers, who believed that he was still alive, spread beyond Palestine so that there were multitudes of them in Rome by 64 AD. And seventh, all kinds of people from cities and the countryside, men and women, slave and free, worshipped him as God. All right. So this is a really nice summary of everything that we get from other historical documents. And it's really important for us to see this because... If the Gospels were portraying Christ as somebody who is very different than his story, than, than other historical documents, what sort of conflict do we see? Like, what problem do we run into? Maybe distrust, like you wouldn't trust what the Bible says if it doesn't match up with what the historical documents and historical findings say. Absolutely. And I mean, you're right on. Like if, if the picture of who Jesus is from the Gospels and the New Testament is so strikingly different than these other historical, um, other historical documents, then we run into trouble. Like we have a hard time validating the gospels, but when we have the gospel accounts and the historical documents, the extra biblical historical documents lining up, then, and, and we start to see a similar picture, it brings strength to our conviction of who Jesus is, right? And so that's a huge a huge part of us being able to stand on firmer ground and say, yeah, the, the gospels are, accurate because we have other historical documents that are quote-unquote non-bias that are allowing you know the picture of Jesus to complement one another or or corroborate but now we have this issue of all these Gnostic gospels right and that's what we have to I want to take some time to figure out together all right and when we talk about the Gnostic gospels all right. We talk about the, you know, the word Gnostic just means knowledge, all right, or, or this idea of knowing. And the Gnostic Gospels were these counterfeit writings that came up um, in the second century that promoted this heresy of Gnosticism, which was this idea that it wasn't the, the act of Jesus Christ that brought us salvation. It was out of this secret knowledge of, of, you know, man and God, that we attain salvation. And when man would die, they would be asked a series of questions. And based on how they answered those questions, they would receive etern eternity or not. So it was purely based on what you knew. It wasn't about who Jesus was, right? And that's what was promoted in all these Gnostic Gospels. And the challenge with these Gnostic Gospels is one, they carry the word gospel, so it's naturally going to be associated with 
the gospel, the four gospels of the New Testament. The other issue with these Gnostic gospels is that they took on the name of the apostles, right? And there was a whole list in the video of all the different Gnostic gospels. And the reason why they did this is because these were all authored after the disciples had, had died. Most of, pretty much all, except maybe John who lingered into the late, um, late first century, um, they had died and these writings came out in the second century. And in order to gain credibility so that people would read them, they just slapped a name on it. Gospel of Thomas, Gospel of Mary Magdalene, Gospel of Philip, Gospel of Peter, all these different names. But when you actually look and read through it, it's much easier to see that these gospels were painting a completely different picture of who Jesus was, right? And if you remember last week, we talked about how strong oral tradition was. That oral tradition is, everybody tends to think of it in this idea of like telephone where I'm gonna say one sentence and it's gonna go around the room and it's gonna come out totally different. That is not oral tradition. Oral cultures have been studied and, and different oral cultures have been studied about how accurate their passing on of the stories were. Um, and they're very accurate. And so when these Gnostic gospels came up and started to circulate, the community of believers was able to look and say, uh-uh, that's not right. Uh-uh, that's, you know, Jesus didn't say that, he didn't do that, and so on. Now, another way you might hear the Gnostic Gospels referred to is the Apocrypha, all right? And Apocrypha is a word that just means hidden. And so um, sometimes you will hear like the Apocryphal books of the New Testament. It it's a very misleading term. And the reason why they took on Apocrypha is because in that idea that it was a secret knowledge, like people are saying it was a hidden knowledge, right? That's why it took on the word Apocrypha or the Apocryphal writings. They were hidden, like they, they carried some sort of hidden knowledge that was essential for the salvation, right? Of, of anybody who wanted to attain salvation. And one of the famous ones is Gospel of Thomas. Okay, and if we just kind of look at a, a quick breakdown that came from the book on who, on who Jesus is, salvation, and ideas of fasting and prayer, how are they portrayed in the Gospel of Thomas? Well, who is Jesus? Someone who imparts secret teachings to the disciples who are mature enough to receive it, right? So it's a very like selective mindset versus when we look in the, the, the gospel of the New Testament, he's the redeemer who saves his people from sin. Different picture. When we look at salvation, gospel of Thomas conveys this idea that salvation comes through a special secret knowledge. You have to be worthy to receive that knowledge. Versus in the New Testament, salvation comes through faith in Jesus. You can't take credit for this gift. It's a gift from God, right? So that's, I don't like the translation of it, but it is what it is that comes from Ephesians. And then look at this one about fasting and prayer. Uh, I also have it down below where it says, if you fast, you will bring sin upon yourselves. And if you pray, you will be condemned. And if you give to charity, you will harm your spirits, All right? So this is what the gospel of Thomas, you know, and, uh, and, and if we look in the other gospel, Gnostic gospels, these are messages that are gonna come from it. And we, and even just as us, like, you know, I'm, I'm assuming nobody has their Bible open, as our, you know, as a Zoom community right now, we can probably look at these and be like, nope, that's not consistent with the faith, all right? Last one at the end, like, everyone who will make herself male will enter the kingdom of heaven. It's not consistent with what we know about Christianity, right? And this is why the Gnostic Gospels were never accepted. And while the Gospels that we know, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and these Gnostic Gospels were in circulation all together at the same time, one of the things that propelled the church to begin to form a canon was because of the Gnostic Gospels, right? They wanted to say, okay, there's a lot of readings, that, writings that are coming out in circulation, and we need to begin to hone in as to what is, is, is right and consistent with our beliefs 
in the practice of the church and what is not consistent. And so you start to see this kind of sifting of like the books of the New Testament that we know of and then the other writings. And that's eventually how the canon of the New Testament formed, right? The, the books were separated because of how they conveyed who Jesus was. All right. One point I want to make is that when you talk about apocryphal books, you have to be careful because apocrypha with respect to the New Testament is different than when we apply it to the Old Testament. It means two different things, right? And it means two different things because if you have the Orthodox Study Bible on your shelf, right, there's 46 books in the Old Testament. And this is what, for the first 16 centuries, the church relied on um, for their teaching, or, or, or this is what the church had a consensus on as far as what the Old Testament had, um, or what the Old Testament would be made of. In 1500, after the Protestant Reformation started, Martin Luther um, came around and he said, no, we only want to use the Jewish scriptures, right? So he went to the Masoretic text, which was a text that was in Hebrew that was used up in, you know, until the um, 1000 AD. And he said that these are the books that we're going to use and all the other books that don't line up with this from the Old Testament, we're not going to use. And he deemed them as apocryphal books, right? But for us as Orthodox and, and even uh, the Catholics as well, we look at this Old Testament canon and we don't consider it as apocryphal books. They weren't hidden books. They were part of, of the life of the church. And so they, it doesn't carry the same connotation as it does in the New Testament. Because in the New Testament, whether you're Protestant or Orthodox or Catholic, you say apocryphal books of the New Testament, we're talking about the same set of books. But when you talk about the Old Testament, the... Um, the apocryphal books to a Protestant are going to be the books that are part of our Orthodox study Bible or a Catholic Bible, right? And there's a lot more that goes into that, but I just wanted to throw it out there and say, okay, there is, there's a difference when we use that word, New Testament versus Old Testament. Um, and, and so challenge yourselves, if somebody's saying it, say, are you referring to New Testament or Old Testament? We're referring to New Testament, they're talking about these Gnostic Gospels. Any questions on that? Can be a bit of a confusing point. All right. Last thing I'm going to mention when we when we talk about the New Testament as well, there's also a benefit that there's a lot of archaeological support to the New Testament and. And because time is, is running short, like when we look at cities and places and landmarks of, of events that happen in the New Testament, you know, the St. Paul's mission trips, uh, historical events that were related to the life of Christ, we have, you know, current day you know, artifacts and archaeological digs and different things that line up with the stories in scripture. And so it's yet another support that, that what we read in the New Testament is consistent with what we see in reality, right? It's consistent with what we see in, you know, pres in, in the present day world. And also, you know, the early church, especially in Jerusalem, one of the things that they were known for is that they would hold special services um, that were at the site of a believed like miracle of Jesus or something unique that happened. So like for, for Lazarus Saturday, they go to the tomb of Lazarus and they would hold a service there. Um, and, and so Jerusalem specifically, the, the history and, and the rights of the church, you know, it, it was very stational. They would go to different stations, just like, you know, for example, on, you know, the remnant of that we have of that is on Palm Sunday. 
during matins when we go around and read the gospel at different stations in the church it's a remnant of this idea of the early church that would go around to the different you know places in jerusalem where christ did something specific that was known about that was handed you know passed down through oral tradition they would hold a liturgy there they would have a special service or um or a procession different things um and so we see that you know the rights of the church are emanating out of history, right? And that kind of brings me to the last point here, is that our theological beliefs are rooted in historical events, okay? Our theological beliefs are rooted in historical events. And that's something for us to, you know, just take a minute like, and even just repeat it over and over, it's, it's significant for us because Christ came and he was a real human being who had a birth, a death, and a miraculous resurrection and an ascension. And as he walked, like, he really, you know, these, these events, these miracles that happened, they were real, Okay. These are real historical events. And, and it's important that our theology come out of history because if our theology came out of thin air, you would question it, and rightfully so. But if our theology and our understanding of the incarnation was coming out of a true history, event in history, where Mary and Joseph were in Bethlehem and Christ was born, right? And Christ at one time went to the Jordan and was baptized. And Christ was crucified under Pontius Pilate. All these his, historical events, they're very, they have multiple dimensions to them. One element of it is, is the, the actual physical historical event. But for us, there's another layer to it, which is our spiritual belief and understanding of what actually happened. Like what actually happened when Christ was born, that God became incarnate? What actually happened when he died on the cross and offered up salvation? What actually happened when he rose from the dead? And what does that do for us? So all, all our theological beliefs that are core to our, you know, that, that form our Christian identity are rooted in history. And so it's really important for us to be able to say that, like, or see that the accounts of Christ in the gospel and in the New Testament corroborate with other historical documents. It gives us strength to our beliefs. And, and that is important because our theology and our feasts and our rites of the church all come from historical events, not like fictitious ideas, but out of historical events. Right? So that's why it's really important for us to be able to see that, yes, we have the Bible, but it, is, it did not pop out of thin air. It, it was real. It was lived. And out of that true living like came the beliefs that we have. Any questions? We're at 9 o'clock. I just have a comment, Abuna. Yeah. Um, I think most people agree that, you know, Jesus um, lived and died on the cross. And uh, a lot of the historical events, I, I think the only controversy is whether or not um, you believe that he is God. Um, that's how I see it. <laughs> And, and as Christians, we strongly believe that, yes, he is God. And that, you know, as Christians, we are even tortured to death um, believing that. I, I agree with you, Mary. We do believe that, you know. But we need to, especially in today's climate, which is very skeptical, which is very much so anti-supernatural, 
um, anti miracles and all these different things that the Christian faith is is attacked uh, for. Um, we need to challenge ourselves to be prepared to engage in those discussions, right? And if if our only standpoint is the Gospels in the New Testament, it's hard for us to be in those discussions at times, right? But when we look at all these different sources and we look at all these different things that do line up, it strengthens our ability to stand, you know, on, on uh, like a bedrock of faith, but also a bedrock of faith that is supported by other historical elements and facts and archaeology and all these different things. So it's important for us. And, and the thing is, in order for us to get to that point of saying that Jesus is God and that Jesus rose from the dead, do you think that we would have an easier time to reach that conclusion or harder time reaching that conclusion if the historical events recorded in the New Testament were contrary to other historical documentation. If the archaeology didn't line up at all. Because coming down to that belief that truly he is the son of God is pivotal to our faith. And, and that takes us to the next step to say like, well, can we believe that he rose from the dead? And when we're talking to people who are extremely skeptical about all of this, you know, we can't, we can't solely approach it from an angle of faith because they're they're coming at a different angle but when we begin to layer the arguments you provide somebody something to think about because ultimately what we want them to believe or hope that they would believe is that truly he is god but christianity you know starting from the time of, of the renaissance is really being written off as just a belief in fairy tales and myths you know, we take it for granted as people who are born into the faith. This is like, we've been indoctrinated with, well, we believe that he is God. Okay, but there's a lot of people out there who don't. And when we want to present the facts to them, how do we present it? How do we engage in the conversation? How do you take somebody who says like, Jesus was just a man or a moral teacher and, and take them through the arguments that, that kind of leave them in this position to say, no, you can't just take them as, as a good moral teacher because, you know, because of X, Y, and Z reasons, which we'll actually get into to next week when we actually look at, you know, Jesus a little bit more, more focused about his miracles, the way he taught, um, and so on, and what he actually claimed to be. We've all grown up like this but there are too many people who are coming in who haven't, and we need to equip ourselves to have those conversations. Sorry for my long-winded answer. All right, I'm gonna close this up and we'll see you next week. And next week we'll be looking a little bit closer at, at Christ and his miracles and, and his teachings and the way he taught, um, which is really important. Um, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Thank you, Lord, for this day, this opportunity to see that truly um, our beliefs do come from, a, from history. Um, it is something real and tangible and explainable. Um, and we pray, Lord, that you would strengthen all our faith, that you would strengthen our ability to articulate our faith to others, especially in a world that is becoming skeptical and hostile. Um, be with all. My brothers and sisters here tonight and guard us until next week through the intercessions of all your saints here as we say our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come.
the will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. To Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is kingdom, power, and the glory for and ever. Amen. All right, everybody. Have a great night. See you next week. And if I can just encourage everybody to try and be there right at 8 o'clock so we can get started by like 8.05. Thank you, Luna. Thank, right. you. Thank you, guys. Good night.